Thank you. It looks like we've got a good crowd. It looks to be a lot of fun, good dialogue. I'll keep it informal like we like to do. Uh, my name's Scott D. I'm the research director at Pipestone. When Jill asked uh, if we could do this again, she had a good idea. She said, let's, let's change it up. Let's not just have a single speaker. Let's have a couple different people, different speaking styles, different topics. And so Patrick was gracious enough to come and say he'll participate. And as we were thinking about it, I thought, well, probably the best person to have on this topic today is Dr. Spronk, chairman of a board at Pipestone Holdings. He leads our China initiative from Pipestone. And I really can't think of a better person to have up here today than to share his knowledge, his expertise with the two of us and all of you. So we're looking forward to a nice morning. And Gordon and I kind of sat down for our presentation. What do we really want to accomplish today with you before we turn it over to Patrick? And he's going to talk about maybe the secure pork supply and some of the action planning going on. And Gordon, we kind of came up with these, uh, these four topics that we'll uh, cover as we go throughout uh, the, the morning here. And this is where I thought, you know, number one, education. How can we really explain to the audience what's happening in Asia? And obviously nobody better than you to help lead that. Number two, I've in, in, introduce a new vision. Uh, we talk a lot about what are we going to do when the virus enters a country. We have a little different approach. We like to keep it out. And so we introduced the vision of what can we do to keep it out? What are the risk factors we have to worry about? How can we do that? And then behavior. What needs to change if we're going to really get this done? And then to succeed, uh, what resources are needed? So you'll see these themes kind of coming through the presentation of the, of, of the two of us today. All right. Gordon, what do you say? You want to kick this off? Sure. Uh, thank you, Scott. My name is Gordon Spronk. As uh, Scott has said, uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, there's two things we need to be aware of when it comes to African swine fever. One is the clear economic opportunity. That's simple. 75% of the world's pigs now have or are threatened by ASF. We do not. If we can remain free, the economic opportunity is nearly off the charts. That's, that's one. Set that aside. The other one is that. The animal welfare issue goes unspoken as producers and veterinarians. We need to do something to prevent that. That's one of dozens of videos you can obtain off of WeChat out of China. That's not by any means unique. That's not by any means the only one. There are many. And so part of the purpose today is Patrick's going to talk about what happens when we get it. Scott and I are going to talk about, well, let's keep it out. That's the new vision, right? If you have a new vision to keep it out, well, then how do you behave? How do you make a decision, a conscious decision? We are the best country in the world. We have the best resources. We have the best technology. I believe we can cast a vision and actually behave and make a decision to keep it out for the reasons I just said. That's where we're coming from. And then lastly, we'll talk about the resources that are needed. Next, next uh, slide, Scott. So, very basic things about the virus. This is different than anything you've seen before. It's a large virus. Scott's the virologist. Scott, it's the largest virus known to pigs. Is that true? Right up there. It's about four times the size of PERS, to put it in perspective. So it's a, think of it like a big tank. It's just a big tank of protein. Very different than a PERS virus with a lot of envelope around it, which is easy to kill. This is a, like you say, Gordon, it's a completely different virus. We've never dealt with something like this before. It's an old virus. It's been around nearly 100 years, first uh, found in Africa uh, almost a, a century ago, made its way throughout Africa, still there, then made its way into Europe, then it's made, made its way into Russia, then made its way into Asia. So it, it has two ways of moving. One way, it moves slowly. Scott, what's the technical term for that? Uh, maybe Basic Patrick, you can help. Number. It, it, it moves slowly in an area. That's really the, the, the wild pigs, the feral hogs. And then it jumps. It jumps. The reason it jumps is, is people. People take contaminated meat or an ethnic dish, take, them with, take the meat with them, and then it infects a new area. That's the two primary ways that this virus moves. And once it's in the environment, it's almost impossible to get rid of. Another good reason to keep it out. You need to get temperatures up to 140 to 160 degrees Fahrenheit to inactivate this thing. 
Very few disinfectants work against it. We're basically limited to bleach, Vercon, some old phenol products. It's, it's like Gordon said, an old virus, and not a lot of work's been done on it recently. So we're kind of behind as far as getting up to speed on what can actually inactivate this thing. But it lives in dirt for months. It lives in meat for 140 to 150 days. Well, they claim in, in frozen meat forever, Forever Scott. in frozen, frozen meat. Frozen yeah. meat, the virus lives yeah. forever. Now, that's quite a statement. In blood, a year and a half. So it loves blood. It loves white blood cells, red blood cells. That's its, its favorite cell of choice. And so... One drop of blood has how many logs of virus? Oh, easily 100,000, 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6, a million, yeah. So bl this is what happens with a clinical presentation. When it starts, only one pig may die. And it look, may look like salmonella. You don't even know that it's African swine fever. It looks like other things that will fool you. And then it'll go very slowly, very slow. So it's not like anything you've seen before. And then what will happen is you'll call your veterinarian because you need a diagnosis. The veterinarian will necropsy pigs. And guess what the veterinarian does when they necropsy a pig? They spread blood all over the place. You know what happens then? It explodes if you make the wrong diagnosis. So, Scott, uh, there's no vaccine. Why is that? Yeah, this, and people have tried uh, for decades to oh, make a vaccine. Yeah, Why? Yeah, they've tried. It, it Why really no vaccine? Has its ability, it has a great ability to evade the immune response. It doesn't, it, it doesn't allow the pig to produce what are called neutralizing antibodies, which are proteins in the blood, which basically glom onto the virus and inactivate it. it. They can't do that. The pig can't do that. Somehow the virus escapes the uh, pig's immune response. And again, very little knowledge about that because it's been so long since the research uh, has really been focused on this area. Okay, any questions about the virus itself? Any questions? Let's move on, Scott. We'll right. a little bit of time. Okay, so here's a map. I apologize, you can't see the map of China. Um, here's what you need to, need to know about and How many see these maps? You can just about get them every day, the maps out of China. And this is what they're officially reporting. The, here's the issue with this official report. There are uh, provinces that are known to be positive that are shown to be negative. I'll let that sink in a little bit. The 33 provinces, you see the red highlights within a province at their government. It's a city, then county. Here we go, state, county, city. There they go, state or province, county. So those reds are where they're, they're known positives. The large pig raising areas, uh, you see way to the left, well, way, way to your left. That's uh, the Uyghurs, uh, that's Aramuchi and uh, way wet. There's, the reason there's, uh, there's no ASF there, there's no pigs there. The pigs are all on the eastern uh, uh, side of the right side of the map. And the, you see the reds actually in Sichuan province is number one, uh, Fujian, Guangdong. Shan, you see Shandong up there? That's one of the, the uh, case studies where it's reported to be negative, but uh, ASF is rampant in that uh, province. So to really know what's happening in Asia, you have to be careful and skeptical of the official government reports. Next slide, Scott. Gordon, I think you used some terminology the other day when we were talking to with uh, Minnesota Pork Board. Oh, yeah, go back to yeah, talk yeah. about the plant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So to go back, Scott. Yeah, go, go back to this. It's appropriate to get that in your mind. One more. We'll go back one more. That, that, the picture that Scott has there of the uh, nuclear plume. Yeah. The point is this. When uh, the initial cases, see that red way up in the right upper right there, the head of the chicken? Way up there. That was Heilongjiang. That's where the initial case was. Well, when farmers found out that they had ASF, one farmer loaded up his pigs and brought them all the way down, way a thousand kilometers down, and basically spread the virus into the rest of the country. From that stand, from that point on, it's been very common economic behavior that if you have sick pigs, the first thing you do is load them up and bring them to the slaughter plant. Now, because of the nature of the virus we just told you, they, they then contaminated the slaughter plants, and now they've contaminated all the meat, and the virus loves to live in meat and the slaughter plants. So that nuclear plume, the, meat, the, <clears throat> the thing that's important there is, is you've got a big virus cloud being emitted out of Asia. So let's just review that. <clears throat> you've got a, <clears throat> a terrible virus. <clears throat> it's now in 50% of the world's pigs. 
and threatening 75% of the world's pigs, and we do a lot of trade with Asia. That's what you should walk out of here with, that, hey, listen, something's changed in our world. And we talked about this virus's stability outside the pig, and this is what scares me, Gordon, is your, your uh, vision of the plume. Right. And you get these kind of photographs, and you see all that virus in the environment, and then that, as that plume grows, we get more and more encroachment on other inanimate objects, say, other, other fomites, other, other vehicles, feed ingredients and such. This, this is like environmental contamination on yeah. steroids. In talking to producers there, uh, when they run their PCRs for ASF, one good example, uh, one of their managers of a sow farm went to a wedding. Uh, they swabbed the bottom of his shoes when they came back from the wedding, and they were PCR positive for ASF. So the chain, Patrick, is contaminated, and they're contaminating everything else. Okay, so we've set the stage. It's pretty grim, right? What's really happening in Asia? That's question number one. Let's educate. Number two, let's keep it out. That's point number two for today. But Gordon, you cross the border all the time, coming back and forth uh, into the U.S. and back to China. What's happening at the border? Yeah. So who else has just cleared customs in the last, well, since ASF in August? Who's cleared customs? Yeah, what, what have you seen? Have you seen dogs? Who's seen dogs? No one's seen. Oh. We got, you saw a beagle? Thank you. Yeah. The beagles, little tip for you, if the beagle sits by your suitcase, you might be delayed. <laughs> Is that right, Paul? Yeah. Beagle sits. You got a problem. So look what they're picking up uh, at Border Control. I just, I just cleared customs last Thursday. It was in Dallas. I didn't see a dog. And we need more dogs. It's one of our number one protections for North America. We need dogs, and we want every targeted load from an ASF uh, positive country to have a beagle meet that, that plane. It's a very simple ask. That authority and that responsibility is under Customs and Border Patrol or protection. We're just simply asking them to do their job and give them the resources to do their job. I was in line with, uh, it's Chinese New Year, so I was in line uh, with, gosh, 100 other Chinese grandmas all coming back to the United States, bringing home what to their families? Their ethnic dishes, mostly uncooked Chinese dumplings or Chinese noodles, uh, pork noodles, pork dumplings, and uh, where they'd flip open their suitcase and you'd, you basically, I, I, I witnessed that uh, Thursday night. Yeah, that's, that's what's happening at our borders. That's yeah, just question. one day at O'Hare. Now, Gordon, when I went to China with you the first time, you showed me this. And you, you know, we were talking about other risk factors besides uh, meat and people. What about feed, environmental contamination on steroids, accidental contact with feed based on the unique way they harvest and process grain in Asia? You showed me this for the first time. Isn't this a natural pathway for the virus? Yeah, hard to believe with, uh, you know, in this room, right, Midwest farmers almost incomprehensible, right? You're looking at that saying, what are they doing there? Well, they're drying their grain. So it's, it's hand harvested or harvested with small, maybe a 20 horse combine or tractor. And then laying it out on the road, a public highway like that is their drying method. It's, it's common every fall. You see, there's, that's nothing unusual. Any one of you could go to, to Asia and take that picture. There's nothing new there. But as Scott says, it increases your risk of contamination because the same highway that they're drying that grain on is the same highway that the truck with pigs transporting them to market is driving over. And you literally drive over the grain when you are on this highway. Yeah, it's amazing. There's nothing that's very cultural. It's, very, it's common. And look at how much we bring in from China in ag products every year. This is uh, Dave Pyburn's work. He went to the U.S. Harmonized Government Tariff Schedule and just asked the question, how many metric tons of agricultural products do we bring in from China every year? And you see it's pretty consistent. It's about 2 million uh, metric tons every year. So again, here we've got viral contamination, we've got feed contamination, we've got feed entry into the United States on a regular basis. And that's where we've been working hard on the feed risk, and many of you are familiar with this, so we're going to go, we're not going to spend much time on it. But we, we, you know the work we've done in the Transboundary Project, 
That shows transport. That shows that the virus can actually live in a model from China to the U.S. or from Eastern Europe to the U.S. in a model, right? Megan Niederwerder just did a study which is fascinating to me where she took African swine fever, put it in, in feed, let pigs eat it, and showed transmission. Showed that pigs could get infected just by consuming contaminated feed. And the, the, main reason, the main thing she took home, it wasn't so much the dose of the virus in the feed, it was the frequency that the pigs contacted the contaminated feed. So there could be very small amounts of virus in the feed, but as pigs eat, as you know, multiple, multiple times a day, the more frequent they, they contacted the virus, the higher the probability that the animals will get infected. So to me, we now have this, the loop. We now have transport and we now have transmission. So a great deal of credit to Megan for her nice work there. You've all seen this chart. This is our red-green table. There's our ingredients that we spiked with virus. There's the different viruses on the top. A red square means the virus survived, either our trans-Pacific, transatlantic model. ASFV is the second column over. Look at all the red. Go down that column. Look at all the red where that virus lived in ingredients in the simulated model. But also look at soy products. Look at the top. Look at all the red as it moves across horizontally in the soy products. Viruses, for some reason, really enjoy soy products, and that's going to roll nicely into some of the discussion we'll have on some resolutions that got passed. Into the concept of changing behavior, talking about what can we do to reduce feed risk, an idea that came from Luke Minion is a concept called responsible imports which he defined as a science-based plan to bring in ingredients of high value or essential ingredients into our country safely as possible using science. So I put an equation together that looks at how to do this. First of all, we asked the question, is the ingredient necessary? Do we have to bring it in? In some cases, it is. B vitamins, certain vitamins from China, it's the only place in the world they're made. We have to bring them in. So question, do we have to bring it in? Number two, What's the level of contamination at the source? We can estimate that. What's the transport time it's going to take to get from, say, Beijing to Des Moines? We can calculate that. What's the mitigant effect on viral load? We'll skip that in a minute because I'm going to show you some new data on mitigation. What's the half-life of the virus in the feed? How long does it take? How many days does it take for half the quantity of the virus to decay? We know that. And then we can calculate a storage time, which has been a, the one, a big change in behavior that has happened in the U.S. since uh, about September when we came up with the idea of responsible imports and storage times. And we can talk about that in our Q&A if you like. But I want to declare 2019 the year of the mitigant because, you see, we don't have a lot of data yet on feed additives that we can use to neutralize viruses in feed. Okay? Now, we've been doing some work. I just want to sh share with you very briefly. It's brand new stuff. This is the first time it's been shown. But it's, uh, we're, we've got a new model in Pipestone. We built what's called a BSL-2 facility. It's a special building with separate rooms that are actually their own individual airspaces. We can put 100 pigs in a room. So now instead of a bioassay-based individual animal study, we can use larger numbers of animals eating feed naturally. And we can treat or not different uh, loads of feed. Here's the facility. Each room has its own bin. We can put mitigated feed or non-mitigated feed. There's a little picture inside. Now, the mitigants that we've tested so far, we've, had two, we've done two projects. One, uh, the company Novus sponsored a project looking at their Activate DA, nutritional feed acid at a 0.5% inclusion rate or a reduced rate of 0.15%. Chem and we just did a project looking at Salcurb at its inclusion rate as well as a new product, the medium chain fatty acid blend that they're developing <laughs> called CaptaSure. Here's our challenge model. So we'll treat the feed with either mitigant or not as a control. We've actually grown up PERS, Seneca, and PED and put them in ice block. So you remember the snowball from hell? This is now the ice block from hell. And so this is a one pound block of ice that contains equal quantities of all three of those viruses. And I can't work with African swine fever, obviously, in a BSL-2, so we're going to use the other viruses. We're going to drop it right in the bin. So this could be mitigated feed or non-mitigated feed. We're going to climb up the ladder and just drop this block right into the middle of the bin and let Mother Nature take its course, let the block melt, let the feed be augured into the room, and let the pigs eat it. 
It's been pretty interesting what we've seen. Some brief results here for you. This is the Novus data. There's the treatments on the left. Two different inclusion rates of activate and a positive control. That means no mitigation. Did the pigs get infected? You can see that in the case of PERS and in Seneca, where there's green, the mitigation prevented infection with PERS virus and Seneca. It didn't prevent it all the way with PED. And you see the positive control, we infected all the animals with those three viruses in non-mitigated feed. Interesting though, with disease, we saw no disease in the mitigated feed treatment groups. No diarrhea, no coughing, no rough hair coats, none of the things you'd see with PERS or Seneca or PED. But we did see it in the positive control. And we saw some growth differences between the full dose and the reduced dose. So a nice response to several viruses in our model with those products. Here's what the Kemen group did. Cell curve and capture and a positive control. They basically pitched a perfect game. They neutralized all three viruses in the feed. No pigs got infected. You can see the positive controls at the bottom in red did. There's the disease, no clinical disease in the treated groups in contrast to the positive control and then you see the growth rate. So now I think we've got some progress on mitigation and our goal is to finish this work by the end of quarter two of this year. So we're looking for certain candidates that we'll put into this model. This is now the gold standard for testing feed mitigation. No longer are we gonna mess with a single little bioassay pig. That model's done its work. Now we need more of the real world model. So that's something new for you today. Gordon, behavior, besides storage times and those kind of things, what else needs to change? You know, we've put a lot of time lately. You have uh, Minnesota Pork Board, Pork Producers Association, Swine Health Committee, NPB, a lot of work on resolutions. We so should share that. Sure, let's go to the next slide, Scott. So I think the point of these slides is, is uh, you as producers need to, uh, you need to be active and ask the appropriate authorities that have responsibility to protect our borders to act. This resolution gets us down that path. As producers, you need to be aware of this activity both at the National Pork Board, Swine Health Committee, and at the Minnesota Pork Producers Council. Yesterday, a resolution was passed. This resolution was passed yesterday. So as producers, be aware of this activity, choose to support or not support, that's your choice, might be wise to support, because here's the, here's the thing that we all need to understand about this virus. We all share the risk. We will all share the economic reward. Now that's different than PED, isn't it? When PED entered this country, there were some winners and there were some losers. If you got PED, you were a loser. If you didn't get PED, you were a winner. This one will not discriminate that way because if this virus enters our industry in North America, specifically the United States, for about 72 hours, Tim, it's going to be chaos, isn't it? It'll be pure chaos. You know why? Because you will not be able to move any pigs. We'll come to a dead stop. Our efforts, our energies, Everything we should do should be focused on keeping it out. And there's one more slide here, I think, yeah, uh, Scott. So here you see responsible imports platform that we just talked about in the resolution specifically, which I really liked. Here's another one that got passed yesterday, Gordon, at the MPPA meeting, looking at the feed ingredient side of the equation. Look at that highlighted text there. There's some action in this resolution. So restricting imports of soy-based products from countries of high risk. Based on that red-green table, you see why that resolution passed. There's science behind these resolutions. And there was even another one that the, the two organizations together passed yesterday, looking at the ongoing dialogue with the other countries in North America. To work together, you see a lot of collaboration, a lot of working together here. Great theme, I think. That, to the question that was asked earlier about Canada and Mexico, yeah. it is a North American protection issue and that's why this resolution is important to protect the entirety of the North American uh, swine herds. 
So Gordon, did we achieve our goals? We haven't talked about resources. What resources do we need to succeed? That's the fourth question. Yeah, let's, uh, I wonder, Scott, if we should bring Patrick up and then we'll, well, let's leave this for the Q&A. So Patrick, why don't you come up right now and then we'll, we'll get back to this.